It seems fair to say that the world looks at Christianity and Judaism as two entirely different religions. You might question the word entirely, but by and large, they do. If that's the comparison, there is something to say for that, because Christianity and Judaism are quite different. But if you're comparing Christianity to the faith of Abraham, you're on entirely different ground, because there you are dealing with something that is the same religion, is the same faith, and has been from the beginning. Christianity and Judaism might be compared to two branches of the same tree, but one does not grow out of the other at all. To borrow a phrase from Paul, don't think that you bear the root. The root bears you. And so Christianity and Judaism, if they're going to look to a root at all, have to look to the root, which is Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, Judaism is called the tradition of the elders. That's the term for it. You do find the word Judaism in Paul's writing where he says, you have heard of my conduct in time past in Judaism, uh, thus placing Judaism firmly in his past in the context of that area. And, but in the New Testament, as I said, it's called the tradition of the elders. Jacob Neusner, in his book, Christi uh, Judaism When Christianity Began, says that there were many Judaisms in the first century. And that is kind of evident as you read even in the New Testament, but more so as you read other histories. The dominant Judaism of the time, which was held by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, rejected Jesus out of hand. And it's easy to see why they did when you read carefully through the passages. Jesus did not fit the mold of the extant Judaism. He was in sharp conflict with it at just about every turn. But he was not in conflict with Abraham or Abraham's God. This is, I think, a really important distinction for us to make. Now, there's an enigmatic statement of Jesus following the episode on the Mount of Transfiguration that I want us to call, to call to your attention in Matthew 17 and verse 10. The disciples asked him, this is after they'd seen Jesus talking in vision with, with Moses and Elijah. They said, why do the scribes say that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and they didn't know him. They have done to him whatever they wanted. Likewise also shall the Son of Man suffer of them. And then the disciples understood that he was talking about John the Baptist. That one came through to them. So he's already come, and they didn't know him. And they treated him however they wanted to. In Herod's case, actually in the case of Herod's wife, it was to cut his head off in prison and deliver it to her on a charger. Now, there are a lot of questions we could ask about this, question, this particular passage of Jesus, but there's one of them that stands out in my mind. The Elijah was to come and restore all things. Now, what's implicit in that statement? What does it imply to us? It seems to me it suggests that there is something that is not there. Something perhaps that should be there, but it's not. And it's going to have to be restored. At one time it was, but now it's not. Now we know that Jesus was talking about John the Baptist, who was an antitype of Elijah, who is, if you follow, use, the Bible, use these scholarly terms, he was the archetype of all prophets. Now it's worth taking a moment to look at Matthew's summary of John's message, John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. The word for wilderness is basically lonesome, the solitary place. He's away from the city. He's away from all the, the, the noise and the bustle of things. He's out there by himself, but he is preaching out there, so he doesn't preach to himself. There are some people there, and word apparently spread from there. Why wasn't he at Jerusalem? I think there's a reason for this, and it kind of emerges as we go along. John's message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, this is a small thing. But in the past, I have read verse 2, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, as John's message. And verse 3 as Matthew's commentary. Verse three, well, this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, 
the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. But I think both these verses are John's message, which means he saw himself as the forerunner of the Messiah. If you take it that those two together, and there really is no reason not to. He later denied he was Elijah, but Jesus said he was. And of course, in literally speaking, he was not. His, his, his denial was acceptable. But Jesus is talking about him as an antitype of, the, of Elijah and a very real player in all of this. At the same time, John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins and his food was locusts and wild honey. He was out there living off the land. Now it's a singular comparison, but this statement is utterly irrelevant to the whole story here, except for one thing. There was an occasion when some men encountered the original Elijah. It was in the reign of King Amaziah. And they, they had, he had been sent them off. He said, uh, sent, sent them to the uh, Beelzebub, I think, the god of Ekron, to see if he would recover of his injury. And they started on their way. Elijah met them and sent them back, saying, no, you're not going to recover. You're going to die. But when they showed up coming back and he said, well, we saw the prophet. He sent us back. He said, what did he look like? He said, he was a man with a garment of hair and a leather belt around his waist. And the king said, that was Elijah the Tishbite. So Elijah wore a, leather, a hairy garment and the leather belt around his waist. Here comes John wearing camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. I think that's why this is in this place because the camel's hair or the hairy garment and the leather around the waist are icons for Elijah. Matthew 3, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea, all the region round about Jordan, and they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So repentance, confession of sins, baptism, this is the core of John's message, and therefore this is what John was beginning to restore, and therefore this is what was apparently missing in society at this time, or in the religion at this time. Now it's intriguing to me that this is seen as a restoration, and all the more so when you read what follows. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O oh, generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now I can't think of very many things that he could have said to them stronger than that. I walk up to a guy, he looks at me and says, Oh, generation of vipers, who warned you to flee? I would take it as an out and out insult, and I'm sure they did. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And don't think to say within yourselves, well, Abraham is our father. For I say to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Now, this is really fascinating, and, it's, and it is, I think, extremely important to understand what is, what, is, what is being said here. They came down there as the carriers of Abraham's faith. That's what their claim was. They claimed it in a way to Jesus as well. And Jesus said back to them, if Abraham were your father, you wouldn't be trying to kill me. That's not the kind of thing Abraham did. And they thought, said at that point, well, you, you got, must have a demon because their question was, how did you know that we wanted to kill you? They were convicted by that. But in the clearest terms, really, John separates these practitioners of Judaism who were in front of him on this occasion from Abraham, doesn't he? He just takes a big ax and, and carves them out and say, here you are, and there Abraham is. Jesus would make the statement, the situation, distinction even more clear later on, if perhaps even a little less blunt, but nevertheless quite clear. And here John comes on and says, now also the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that brings not forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Funny, I hear some Christians talking about being fire baptized. I would hope not. I really would hope not, because what he's talking about here, fire baptism, is a totally different matter. Listen to how he goes on. His fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly purge his floor. He will gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff 
with unquenchable fire. Now, basically, he is telling these Pharisees and Sadducees who have come down here, they're going to get separated out, and they're going to be baptized with fire. But that's another matter. I, I, I don't think I want the baptism of fire. It's for those who are not bearing fruit. It's for the chaff, not the wheat. Now, I told you all that to come to this. Of all the things I learned in writing the book, The Thread, one of the greatest is that God has a consistent method of revelation throughout all the stories of the Bible. And that God is nothing if not consistent. I've got some proofreaders that are on my case about all that time because I'm not necessarily, but God is. Now, there's an assumption abroad today that the holy days of the Bible are Jewish. They came into existence to commemorate events in Jewish history. And now that Christianity has parted company with Judaism, there is no need for Christians to keep the holy days. That's a common way people look at this thing. Now, there are two scriptures that kept that from working for me. One of them, and I'm just going to read you a verse in each case, Hebrews 13.8. You know it. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? Bingo. The other scripture is James 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now, I take these two scriptures together, and I conclude, no, God will be consistent right down through time in the way he works, how he works, when he works, and so forth. This is entirely logical. It's what one would expect of the God who made all this. You would expect him to be consistent. You would expect him to have a plan. You would expect him to work the plan and never miss a lick. Now, I'm going to add one more scripture to the mix. This is James speaking at the Jerusalem conference. One statement Very important statement to remember. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So whatever he was going to do, he knew it before he ever started. Now, all this being true, it seems logical to me that the holy days that we observe were there right from the get-go. And this was the thing that began to eat on me in the really years that led up to the publication of The Thread, Uh, but really kind of gelled in the months leading up to the publication of the thread. One clue for me was found in Leviticus 23, verse 2, in the meaning of a word. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocation, even these are my feasts. Okay. The word for feast is the Hebrew moed. It means properly an appointment, a fixed time, a season. In other words, God is saying, these are my appointments. And so I began to think about this and and, and consider that God has appointed times. And consequently, it's reasonable to think that any time he decides to act in history in a major way, it will be at one of these appointed times. We know them. There's seven of them. We've got names for all of them, and we've been observing them for a long, long time. Now, I want you to get all mystic on me on this, though. It's not as though there is a hole out here or a spot in space-time where when the earth goes through it, suddenly God is there and he will act and he doesn't act at other times. No, that's not what I'm driving at at all. The calendar, whether it be the Hebrew calendar, whether it be the Roman calendar, is a human invention. Just get used to the idea. The calendar, per se, whether it's Hebrew or what, is a human invention. So your God, you come down to talk to people and to reveal to them when your appointment times are, are what what are you going to tell them? Well, you've got what choice? You can do one of two things. You can give them an entirely new calendar, or you can tell them where they're going to happen in the calendar they're familiar with. I think he did the latter. Because there is, I mean, if, if you take a look through the Bible about this, you will find the stark shortage of scriptures giving you any kind of instructions about a calendar. I can think of one and one only in the entire Bible, and that's not enough. What's the instruction? This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. That's all. Now, they knew what month that was. The only reason we know what month it was was because of their tradition that followed down through the years. 
We was connected to the Passover. The Passover was handed on down, and we learned, you know, laws having to do with the first fruits. And then we are able in the land to put this together and say, oh, that's the month. That is the beginning of months. But it's never really laid out calendar-wise in the Bible. And in fact, someone pointed to the fact that the word, the name of the first month, Abib, means green ears. Okay, fine. Where were they when he told him that? Egypt. Do the ears become green in Egypt the same time they do at Jerusalem? No, they most certainly do not. The big difference between them, somebody drove down this year to, to Tyler from up north and they were really commenting on how everything greened up as they came south. And I've noticed it the other way when I've gone north uh, leading up to the Passover, how everything dries out and ungreens going north and it's, it's kind of an, a lesson. Well, the same thing is true. In fact, there's an indication in the book of Acts, I'll leave it to you to look it up, that the uh, day of the wave sheaf or the day when they began their harvest was about a week uh, later up in Troas from what it was in Jerusalem, a different time. They, did, they couldn't actually start the harvest at the same time the Jerusalem Jews would have done. Okay, it's true that the sun, the moon, and the stars were given at creation as a tool that could be used for the measurement of time or the creation of a calendar, but the Bible doesn't tell you what the calendar is. There are no distinctions anywhere. There's no specification of actually how you determine when the new moon is, what constitutes the first day of another month, when the 13th month is added in the years to keep it in sync, you only can find little hints here and there because it will tell you how long it was from one month to the other and you have to realize, oops, there were 13 months in that year. So you can see it, that it was there, there are no instructions for it. So where did they come from? The Jews created their own calendar. Actually, they probably adapted their own calendar from a Babylonian calendar or for the Egyptian calendar or what have you. It is a standard lunar calendar adjusted for the seasons so the agriculture comes out in connection with the Holy Days. That simple. Now, whatever the case, it occurred to me to ponder how often God in intervenes in human affairs and what happened on that day, on those days before there ever was a Jew, an Israelite, or Moses. It's in there. Now it's my guess, and it's only a guess, that every major intervention of God in human affairs took place at a moed, an appointed time. If I'm right, then the dividing of tongues at the Tower of Babel took place at a moed, an appointed time. If you were God, wouldn't you do that? You'd say, I know, say I'm, going to, I'm going to divide their tongues. When am I going to do this? I know when I'll do I have this moed coming up. I'll do it on that day. Which one was it? Pentecost. Think about it. Think about it. Okay, more important than that, though, is an event that involved Abraham. It's in Genesis 22, verse 1. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. He tested him. And he said to him, Abraham, I'm here, Lord. He said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and get you to the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell you of. This is an absolutely crushing statement. You know, I don't know that I fully appreciate it. It's a funny thing how sometimes things come to you in a, in a movie, an act, a presentation, a drama, and this one really did. Because I'd heard a preacher in the past who was making a big thing out of our obedience to God and how we should obey without question. And he said, when God told Abraham to do this, he didn't ask any questions, he just got up and went. And he presented it to us as though God, Abraham was so strong in the faith that it didn't even bother him. And then I saw George C. Scott in the movie The Bible portray Abraham in this situation, and I began to realize, you no, know, no, this was not easy for Abraham. If it was easy for Abraham, it was meaningless. And if there's one thing this event is not, it's not meaningless. This is not done just uh, routinely or just because there's a quirky God up there behind his console, you know, the one that... Uh, uh, Gary Larson drew, drew the picture of God sitting at the console, big long beard, and there's one button up there that says smite that he could hit. It's not like that. So anyway, I have become absolutely persuaded myself that Abraham here is a type of the father, and Isaac is a type of Jesus, and that what God was doing in Abraham was giving the lesson 
of what he was going to do for all of us when Jesus came. So we're, again, we're dealing with the same God, same religion, and that it really was a sacrifice for God to give his only son that way. And I think this is here because we will have an easier time identifying with Abraham than we would have identifying with God, who knows what he's going to do, knows when he's going to do it, knows how he's going to do it, and so forth. We think it's easy. I don't think so. I don't think so, because he gave us a very human example. Now, for this to be meaningful, Abraham could not be told what the end of He had to be kept in suspense about that. God explains nothing. He just gives instructions. Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, and take him and offer him as a burnt offering. Now, what kind of faith did this require? Well, Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. He split the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place God had told him of. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place way off. Now, that's interesting by itself. Why the third day? Why, not, why even mention how long it took him to get there? I think there may be something of interest here. And it connects to the Passover. The lamb is selected when? Tenth day of the, of the month. When is it sacrificed? On the 14th day. So here this is, three days out, he spots the place, and apparently then it's on the fourth day that he goes to the mountaintop to sacrifice idol. Isaac. You wouldn't, you'd never think about this. It just seems, reads in here like part of the story, but there's no reason for that statement about three days to be here unless it had something to do with the story. Abraham said to his young man, you stay here with the animal and I'll go, with the, go yonder with the lad to worship and come back. Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering, sorry, wood for the burnt offering, and laid it upon Isaac, his son. He took the fire in his hand and a knife and they went both of them together. Isaac, like Jesus, had to carry the wood of his own sacrifice. I think this is intentional. Isaac spoke unto Abraham, his father, and said, my father, here I am, son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood. Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And so they went on, both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. Abraham built the altar, put, took some stones, I'm sure, and put it together, laid the wood on it in order. And then he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. So little, so little is said of what this felt like, of the interaction between them, of the expression on Isaac's face, of what Isaac might have said, of what he might have asked. Nothing is said. We are left to think it through. And for those of you who have a firstborn son, it probably could come home a lot more bitterly than it might for someone who does not. We know those emotions are there, and we know it was not easy for either one of them. Well, Abraham then stretched forth his hand, took the knife to slay his son. And at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Lay not your hand on the lad, neither do them any harm. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now, I think some people believe in a God who dissembles, a God who would lie, a God who would deliberately mislead you on something, that he would uh, be tricky about this kind of thing. And therefore, this statement, now I know, was really just for Abraham's benefit and was not a true statement. I don't agree. I don't agree. What I think it means to me is that God did not know, and neither did Abraham, what he would do until they came to the moment. Why would God not know? Because he left Abraham free to choose. And if Abraham was not free to choose, then the whole exercise was meaningless. If it was a fait accompli, if it was certain which way it would go, why go through it all in the first place? And all the meaning is, is, is milked right out of it. Unless you understand that Abraham at any moment in time could have said, nuts to this, I'm going home. But he never did. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there was a lamb caught in the thicket by the thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering. 
in the place of his son. And he called the name of that place Jehovah Yira, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. I think the NIV catches the sense of this verse very well. It says, Abraham called that name of that place, the Lord will provide. Actually, the idea of God seeing is he will see to it. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. As an aside, the expression of the mountain of the Lord seems to describe either Sinai or Zion at different times. So I don't think you can draw any hard conclusions. Uh, my guess is that Abraham's sacrifice was on Mount Zion, Mount Zion at what would later be called Jerusalem. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if it's right there where the Dome of the Rock is to this day. But I think that is one of the traditions that go with it. Hebrews now chapter 11 verse 18. Sorry, verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place which he should receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing where he went. Now, it wouldn't surprise me at all to learn that Abraham's departure took place on the 15th day of the first month. His exodus from a Gentile country to head off into the promised land was right there. Or perhaps it was on the 15th day of the seventh month with another festival. By faith, he journeyed in the land of pro uh, sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. And candidly, this whole thing of the living in tabernacles this way, as it's developed in Hebrews, I think definitely points at the Feast of Tabernacles, the significance involved in it. He looked for a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. And if memory serves, Isaac was born on a Moab, an appointed time. And that's what God says we're going to do. I'll be back here at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Therefore, there sprang even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and the sand by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Man, they died in faith without having received the promises. Boy, what does that say? I mean, we pray and pray and pray. We, we're, we're looking for a promise or a blessing or something from God, and we want it to happen now. At least while we're alive, that's what we're looking for. But to go all the way to your death in absolute faith, looking for that city and knowing that it lay on the other side of the grave, that's faith. They that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. If they'd been mindful of the place they went and came out of, they could have gone back. But now they desire a better country that is heavenly. So God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. What a fascinating expression. I'm not sure that the translators got it right, but it, it, it sounds right. God is not ashamed to call them, that for them to call him his God, which kind of suggests that it could be that he might be ashamed of them or ashamed to call them God. But anyway, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac shall your seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, whereby he received him in a figure. In other words, typologically or figuratively, he got his son back from the dead. This is very revealing because Paul sees it very clearly that he did not know that God was going to stop him from doing this. His assumption was, in faith, that he would bring Isaac back from the dead, that God was able to do that. A passage from Isaiah comes to mind. Isaiah 46, verse 9. Remember the former things, those of long ago? I am God and there is no other. There is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. Really, I would expect he would. Did you catch this? I make known the end from the beginning. 
right from the start. Now, if you want to understand what God is going to do, you look at what he has done. That's what he's saying. The truth of God is, in a way, like a palindrome. A palindrome is one of those words that spell the same front to back, back to front, like radar or madam, exactly the same no matter which way you go. And in the fact, history, divine history, is a lot like that. It plays through to a climax, and then it plays on beyond it, going back to where it started out in the first place. At the beginning, Genesis 2, verse 8, the Lord God <coughs> planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight, good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is where we start. In a garden, a paradise with the tree of life right in the middle of everything. Then there is the end. Revelation 22, verse 1. John says, the angel showed me a river, pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of the Lamb, of God and the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Wow. We come full circle, right back to where we started from, with a beautiful place, a paradise, with the tree of life in the middle of everything, which can be for the healing of the nations, of the peoples, the Gentiles, of all of us, as a matter of fact, which is what this is all about. Later in verse 12, Behold, I come quickly, he said, and my reward is with me, to give to every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega. Catch this, the beginning and the end. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. So we start out there. We end up back there. Modified, of course, a little different somewhat, but nevertheless, back there. And we should never make the mistake that the end has nothing to do with the beginning. No matter how many detours we may take, no matter how many errors we may fall into, we must always find our way back to the path, to the plan of God that will take us right on through. Now, we see through a glass darkly. The time is coming when we'll see more clearly. But it's good for us to work our way through these things, to study, to think about these things, because in that, we are looking toward the end from the beginning. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So there are things we will understand and things we will guess at, we'll theorize over, but we're always thinking about him and about what he is doing. And finally, Proverbs 25, verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. The honor of kings is to search it out.